Hey everybody, it's Wednesday, it's noon, it's time for our busy webinar. My name is Trigby, with me as always is my colleague Jenna. Hello. Jenna, today we're going to be talking about the great benefit of the holidays and trying to get ready for 2017. Are you ready for 2017? I'm getting ready. I'm mentally preparing myself. Yeah, you and me both. How was your uh, Thanksgiving holiday? It was pretty good. Yeah? Um, I was far, far away in the land of Wisconsin, which is right next door right. <laughs> for us in Minnesota. Right. Um, you know, just enjoying the cultural experience of being able to buy liquor at uh, gas stations and shopping centers and not having to go to a uh, <laughs> liquor store like we do here in Minnesota. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, I got to go to my Uncle John's. And um, he made a turducken from scratch. He didn't buy one. He made it from scratch. Impressive. Yeah, but he didn't think it was complicated enough, so he added layers of ham. So it was a <laughs> tur ham duckin, and it was uh, it was something else. It was something to behold. So, well, uh, you know, Jenna. Every time we do this, we always have interesting problems. So let's see if we're uh, let's see if we can get this working and uh, up and running. You know, it's all green on my end. Excellent. Now, so. Ac excellent. So uh, we are going to be going through a tremendous amount of information at quite a clip. So for those of you who are watching live, uh, thanks for watching live. If you are interested in talking with us or getting this slide deck after the fact, be more than happy to give it to you. Jenna's email and my email are on the screen now. Uh, in addition to that, for uh, those of you watching live, this does get posted automatically to YouTube. So if I'm going too fast, if I cover too much too quick, or if I'm just that interesting, then you can go back and watch this later on YouTube. So, um, <clears throat> bef but, so uh, let me just check one technical thing, and it looks like we're good and ready to go. Jenna's job here today is she's going to be monitoring Twitter. If you are interested in asking us a question in real time, we'll be more than happy to answer it. Uh, it the, you want to use the hashtag BusyWebinar, so BusyWeb, I-N-A-R. If you do a hashtag and a tweet on that, Jen is going to be able to see it and stop me from whatever I'm doing and uh, interrupt and and tell, tell and uh, ask the question. So thanks again for joining us. For those of you who are new to BusyWeb, we're a full-service digital marketing agency. We're based in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. It is a balmy one degree today, and we are uh, looking out on the highway and seeing snow. And uh, Jen and I both <coughs> said it was very, very cold here today, unfortunately. So uh, later, can we huddle for warmth? Uh, we can certainly try. <laughs> Excellent. That'll make a difference. Excellent. I'm pretty sure you're going to get the better part of that deal, though, just because there's... Yeah, there's, I, I don't have yeah. a lot of uh, to contribute to. Yeah. Huddle pile, sorry. Well, we'll give it. We'll give it a shot anyway. Uh, what is a digital marketing agency? We are a full service agency, meaning we take everything from creating a logo to building a web presence for you, and then uh, helping you grow an audience by using digital marketing techniques like email marketing, which is one of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we help you grow your audience, get your audience to actually take affirmative action, and hopefully, at the end of the day, improve your bottom line. So today we're going to be talking about email marketing, but before I get into it, I thought it would be good to really get us on the same page because there's a lot of different ideas about email marketing, and it's important to really, as, as we're talking about it, really define the terms that we're going to be talking about. So we think email marketing is delivering professional email communications to an interested audience containing information the recipient finds valuable that looks great in any inbox. That is a mouthful to say the least. So I highlighted the, the, the words that are really important here. Professional email. It has to look great at any time. Your audience has to be interested in what you're sharing. Otherwise, they're going to delete it. The, the information has to be found valuable by the recipient. Otherwise, they won't do anything with it. And it has to look great in any inbox. That's a lot to go through, so we're going to make sure that we try and cover everything today. But why is email important? It's because it's a great value for not a lot of money. So it helps drive revenue and profit. By and large, the statistics will show you that for every dollar you spend on email marketing, if you do it well and you do it right, you should get at least a 400% return on your inv investment. So there's, it drives profit. It can help you create awareness and increase awareness as well. It really is a great opportunity to get the word out 
and to try and uh, show new people something that you're trying to do. And more, most importantly, in this day and age of digital, it can help you uh, re get repeat business and keep the business that you have. So it's really a great tool. One of the things that we're going to be talking about today is our relationship with Constant Contact. Uh, we think Constant Contact is a is a great value, and that they're actually one of the people that are sponsoring today's webinar. So <clears throat> I'll talk about Constant Contact a lot. Uh, and, and even offer you a, a special deal that uh, we were able to get out of constant contact for you today. So here's, here's what we're going to talk about and how we're going to do it. We're going to break down why should you be looking at email marketing. Then we're going to talk about how to harness the power of the inbox, how to grow a healthy list, how to create great content, how to develop a beautiful mobile-friendly template that matches your brand. That sounds a lot scarier than it really is how to get your email opened and noticed, and then finally how to track your results. And then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up by putting it all together. We're going to be here for probably the better part of an hour because we've got a lot to go through. So again, if you have questions and you want to participate live as we're doing this, uh, please use the hashtag busywebinar and Jen is going to interrupt me. So let's start with why email marketing. So question for you, Jenna. Yes. What's the number one app on smartphones? I think I know the answer to this because we're talking about email. Um, so that's a little bit. <laughs> but, but you and I are both Pokemon players. That's true. Well, number one app, you know, in terms of popularity or number one app in my heart? Those are two different questions. Well, let's go with in terms of worldwide popularity because as we, we've tried creating a business model based on what's popular in your heart. It just didn't work out for us. No, there's only one of me. So. Yeah, that's true. You are an original. So, um, I'm going to guess email. You're right. It is email. More than half of all emails are open on a mobile device. And that's really scary when you consider that there are billions of mobile devices in the world. Point of fact, more people own a cell phone, a smartphone, than a toothbrush. It's about 4.9 billion to 4.2 billion. So somewhere in the world, there's 700 million people who are talking to you on the phone that you should be glad are not right next to you. More importantly than that, uh, people read email constantly and consistently on the phone. The statistics will tell you that 91% of people check their email every single day, and most of those people do so on a smartphone. And point of fact, most of those people do it at least 10 to 15 times a day. So the good news is it's reliable, and it's where our, our customers are, because that's where just about everybody is. Email gets delivered 90% of the time successfully. Whereas if you post something on Facebook, by and large, only about 2% of your fans are going to see it, even if you're doing it really well. Email works everywhere, meaning your customers can be anywhere, they can be anybody, and they are going to be catching your email and seeing it. It's got a tremendous conversion rate compared to social media. Statistically, it's usually about 3%. And as I said, for every dollar spent on email marketing, there's an average return on your investment of about $45. So if you, spent, if you buy a Constant Contact account and you work it and you do it well, you should realize a tremendous value from that. First impressions uh, really do matter. And uh, this will be a funny contrast, especially because Jen is in the room. If, if, if somebody gave you that flower, Jenna, would that be really interesting to you? Would you want to spend time with that person? No, I'd probably run probably not. in the opposite direction. But the funny thing is, is elementally, it's the same flower as this. One just looks better than the other. And that's because first impressions really matter. And as we're talking today about email marketing, we want to keep in mind the idea that we want to present a really great professional brand. And even that wilted flower is the same thing. Can you present yourself in a great way or an average way? And that's, and that's absolutely crucial. So back in the dark ages of the internet, a time in my life that I like to call college, this was really, uh, the, the one on the left was really amazing email. You got to put 300 names in the two field, and you got to write all sorts of stuff in there, and it really, and it got sent immediately to all those people around the world. And that was really technologically amazing back in uh, the dark ages of the internet, a time in my life I like to call college. But invariably what happens is, no matter what, you get one person to do the worst thing in the world, which is to hit the reply all button. And they immediately send something to all 300 of your prospects, and you start immediately wondering why you included them on the email in the first place. Now, on the right, a time in her life she likes to call college, that's what Jenna's 
idea of really technologically savvy thing is, and, and Jenna is, is much more advanced. So it's, it's simple, it's cleaner, it's brand specific, it has a specific call to action, it gets sent, it gets sent individually to all of our email list, and really actually creates a great marketing tool that we can use to our advantage. So why does regular email not work? Well, there's a number of reasons to keep in mind. There's no formatting control. You can only send to a certain amount of people. It's very susceptible to filters and spam complaints. And really, the, 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 the punchline to regular email is, how do you know if it's successful? How many people have opened your email? How many people have done what you wanted them to do by getting the email? You really don't have an appreciation of that because it's just simply text. Whereas uh, email marketing and constant contact by extension solves a lot of those uh, issues for you. You get to create a great brand identical template for you, manage your subscriptions automatically, ensure the delivery, and even obey the law for really not a lot of money. And it's really a, a, a tremendous amount of tool. So let's get into it. And uh, before I do that, Jenna, do we have any questions on the hashtag busy webinar that we need to answer? Not yet. Awesome. Fantastic. So let's talk about how to grow a healthy list. One of the issues that we have here at BusyWeb all the time when we start talking to people about email marketing is, I don't know, I don't have a big list. Well, you, you, chances are you probably have a list much bigger than you think you do, but more importantly than that, it's easy to grow a list. The easiest thing to do is very complicated. Get a pen and write this down. Number one, ask. That's it. Just ask. Asking people for their email and telling them why that you want why you want that and what they get from it, what's in it for that other person is a tremendous way to grow your list. You do have to ask. If you don't ask, nothing happens. <clears throat> it's important to get permission though, and it's important to ask. Before I leave, I want to say that by and large, six times out of ten, if you ask somebody for their email address, they're going to give it to you. So really, as we're trying to look at other strategies to grow our email list, we really only have to worry about four out of ten people. Because if we do the ask, then it's really going to create that create that growth that we're looking to hit. So how do we ask? Well, we want to make sure that we get express consent. What does that look like? In, in, and getting an affirmative answer. Jenna, can I add you to my email list? Yes. See, there's express consent. Now, if she were to say no, and then I send her an email, that would be very, very bad. Be very straightforward in how you do it. Jenna, can I add you to my email list? I think you'd really be able to take advantage of a lot of the things that I put out in my email newsletter. Sure. Great. Excellent. You also want to make sure that you offer an opt-out. This is particularly relevant for us in Minnesota because we're, <clears throat> by nature, a very passive-aggressive people. So Jenna said yes to me, but if she really doesn't like me or really doesn't find the information useful, we want to give her the opportunity to disconnect from my emails without having to tell me that she doesn't like me or my email lists. So make sure that we offer an opt-out. Next, we want to make sure that we respect our privacy. So when we ask people for their email list, we want to make sure that to join our email list, we want them to understand what exactly we're going to do with it and what we're not going to do with it. So having a privacy policy and letting people know up front what you're going to be doing with that is, is tremendously important. And finally, be legally compliant. There are a number of uh, particular little idiosyncrasies that you have to use with an email service provider in order to be considered legal and not selling spam. Uh, and uh, most good email service providers, especially Constant Contact, will uh, force you to do the legally compliant things and before you can even send out an email. So where do you ask people beyond just asking a question directly? Jenna and I are sitting in the room together, and it's great that I've been able to ask her the question, but what if she's not actually in the room? What, what is a, a, a passive way of getting an affirmation? Well, there are a lot of different ways. Now, I can have a join my email list on a, on, a, on a button, which leads to a form, which then leads to my email list. Ultimately, that we, and we want to put those kind of buttons just about everywhere. So we want to, if we're doing an event like this, we want to say, hey, can we, you join our email list? QR codes are another interesting way in which you can grow your email list. 
even a sidewalk sign that says join our email list by going to this particular address. Having an unchecked box, meaning if you're filling out a form or filling out a particular piece of information, have an unchecked box there that says, yes, if you check this box, you'll be added to our email list. Fish bowls are great. Uh, put your business card in here and we'll add you to our list or maybe even pull out a prize. But really the most important way, and this is, these are just a couple of the good examples and ways in which you can do this, ultimately the most important thing that you want to stress and you want to think about is asking the question. How can I ask the question in, in a way that I feel comfortable asking and I feel comfortable that the people that I'm going to be asking are going to say yes? There's a lot of different variables that go into that. There's a lot of different ways that that can manifest itself. But ultimately, the more you ask, the more you will receive and the more you will get somebody to say yes. One of the interesting ways that uh, Constant Contact specifically has to join their email list is, is text to join. This is a fun feature, and I wanted to display this because I'm going to ask you at the end of this presentation to join our email list. So anyway, at Constant Contact, you can enter in a keyword, and that actually gets you to uh, <clears throat> some of the advertising that we talked about earlier. So you can text a keyword to a specific number, and then you, it will get ask you to join that particular email list. So in the digital age, and especially in the last 18 months where much of the digital world has focused exclusively on, uh, on mobile, this is a great way to bridge the gap between the two. But don't forget when you're doing this, ultimately we have to give people a good reason to say yes and a good reason to stay. So what are some of the things that we want to offer? Well, we want to offer continuing and ongoing education. We want to make our customers and our, and our prospects truly feel special that they're getting something that, from us that they wouldn't get from somewhere else. Insider News is a great place to go and a, a, and a great thing to share as well. What that does is it creates thought leadership. And what thought leadership is is that if somebody views you as an expert, when they need an expert, they're more than likely going to call you. Ebooks and white papers do much of that same thought leadership, but then again, that gives you a, a, a digital giveaway that you can literally put in somebody's hands. If you have cultural updates and interesting things that are going around on in the office, one of the things that Jen is very good at is making sure that she keeps us, our audience updated on the, the new and interesting things that are happening here at BusyWeb. And then also discounts. Uh, everybody loves a discount. Everybody loves an opportunity to save a little money, and they love to feel special. So if you can combine those two, then you're really going to have something really special. Most importantly to keep in mind, though, no matter what you, you, you offer, is that the number one reason that people unsubscribe from, from an email list is because it's not interesting and it's not relevant. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. How do we create great content that really is interesting and really is relevant to our audience? Well, the first thing and the most important thing is really to put your interests ahead beside and put your readers' interests at the forefront. So at the end of the day, you will always buy from you because you know you're an expert and you know how good your product and service is. But not everybody else knows that and you have to teach them how to do that. And the way in which you want to teach them is by understanding what makes them tick and what makes them want to say yes. And so, so there's a tremendous amount of overlap between what you think and what your customers think, but there's a little bit of space there that isn't what you think that is really where the money grows, and that's listening exclusively to what your customers' lists are, the interests are. So you want to focus on being relevant. What do my customers find interesting? Second, you want to figure out how much is enough. If you overwhelm your customers and your, and your prospects with too much information, they're going to sort of tune you out. Think of the guy that you know because we all know that one person who posts 15 times on Facebook every single day. The more we, you get overwhelmed by that person, the less you are interested in, in reading or learning about what that person is sharing because there's all, if you wait five minutes, there's going to be something more. We want to make sure that we avoid that mistake. Third, we want to be able to turn our questions into content, and we'll get into that because that's a really valuable point. And then finally, think about images. Images are content. Images are great in the right place and in the right hands. I'll give you some uh, feedback on how to do that in the most appropriate way. So why do we write for our audience, not for you? Well, if it's not written for our audience and they find it boring, 
40% of the time they're out the door. They're just going to unsubscribe. More frighteningly is 32% of people will be sent to spam, which will, will then prevent you from sending out more emails. So there is actually a serious consequence besides the idea of not making money if we do not <coughs> cater to our prospects and our customers' interests. So when we write for our audience, what we're trying to do is create something that's interesting to them. So I had some dog owners there. This is a, an example of, of a dog uh, email that's focused on those people. So this is a groomer. Their idea is they want people to come into the store to get their pet groomed. But in order to do that, what they're showing is a very clear demonstration of their expertise for their, for their dog owners and, 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 their, and their potential customers. So how much is enough? Well, that's a question we get a lot, especially here in Minnesota, where by and large, Minnesotans don't like tooting their own horn. How does what what is what is really sort of a rule of thumb that we can use to apply to our emails to understand what what's too much? Well, there's a couple of different things. Number one, less is more. So if you think you you are overwhelming your people with too much information, chances are good that you have overwhelmed them and you need to dial it back. So less is more. Think of only 20 lines or text of text or less in an email. More than that, and people's eyes are going to get tired before they even start reading it just by the look of it. You also want to make sure that you don't have a lot of imagery. If you're going to include imagery, imagery is great, but you want to make sure that you're holding up to three pictures or less. More than that, and people are not going to know where to go and what to look at. Links are something that uh, are really valuable in an email marketing campaign, but they're also very dangerous. The purpose, the, the good rule of thumb here is to not have a lot of them because if you give somebody the opportunity to take five different doors, they're not going to be taking the door that you really want them to do. And I showed statistically here how if we have more links, how the amount of clicks that we get on any particular link goes way, way down. So <laughs> depending upon how many clicks they have. So realistically, what we want to see is one to two. That will get us the most amount of action, which is really going to create that buzz that we want to see. And then at, at about the three level, it really has a steep decline. It's almost like a reverse hockey stick if you lay a hockey stick down. And the more links and more links, the less people are going to click on that. So when you're creating your email, try and make sure that you've got only one to two links and really a, 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 a specific call to action. What I mean by a call to action is when you're creating your email, you're going to want your audience to do one specific thing. What is that one specific thing? And then <clears throat> make sure that that's at the forefront of your email. Before we get into this, I'm going to quickly stop and say again, for those of you who are participating online and live, if you have any questions that you want to answer and ask and answer, have asked in real time. Wow, I just that was a bungle. <laughs> I, I was <clears throat> boy with boy with allies like you, man. Jeez, do we have any questions using the hashtag busy webinar, Jenna? Uh, we do not um, at this time. Great. Well, now let's get back into it. We talked very briefly about turning questions into answers, and this is a really interesting strategy that I think can help you right off the gate and right out of the bat. <clears throat> so all of us have frequently asked questions. Those are the questions that in our work lives we get asked a lot and we have to answer a lot. So as we're thinking about what do we write and how do we write it, really what we want to do is turn those questions that we get asked into content. So here's a couple of questions that are just that people ask, and especially in the winter time. How do I ensure my pipes won't burst? Or it's going to be tax time soon. How do I deduct the mileage that I use for volunteering? Or even how do I get more people to come to my events? Those are just standard questions that, depending upon your industry, you you, you will have specific ones like that that you that you get asked all the time. Look what happens when we turn those into content. Five ways to protect your pipes this winter. Not only do we provide a content piece that gets us answering that frequently asked question, now we've created a piece of content that we can use to market the business. Same with the mileage deduction questions and the event attendance. We're taking something that is an unknown and creating it into an asset that we can use to make us better known in our community. Secondly, 
images are crucial, especially when it comes to digital marketing, because at our heart, human beings are visual animals. You <clears throat> eat with your eyes before you eat with anything else. You start to think about things as you see them before you even hear, smell, or talk to people. So make sure that you have really great images, because 90% of all information that we intake as people is presented by the brain is visual. I'll say that again because it's an interesting number. 90% of information processed by the brain is visual. So just remember those emails, the, 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 uh, the evolution of emails, that one with a lot of paragraphs in it. 25 years ago, that was really interesting. It's not interesting anymore. When you are working with photos, it's important to keep a number of things in mind, though, to make sure that you don't have problems after the fact. Number one, you want to make sure that you choose the right size of photos. That's not, and this is going to get a little technical, but stay with me. There are two different kinds of photo resolutions. One is for print, the other is for the web. And it's measured by what's known as DPI. That stands for dots per inch. The appropriate web size is 72 DPI. So if you're purchasing a stock photo, make sure that it's 72 DPI about that number. You can get higher resolution ones for print, which is great, but it also means that it's four, close to four times the amount of data that somebody's going to have to download, which slows down the email and it's going to make people less interested in reading your email. Next, you want to make sure that you can avoid copyright issues. The way you do that is by making sure that if you use a photo, you have the rights to use it. What do I mean by rights? The original ph photographer that who took the picture, that is their intellectual property, and they can do with it as they see fit. How do you avoid that? Well, number one, you can buy using buy photos using a stocking house, at which point you have a certain amount of terms and, and conditions that you have to agree to. But the easiest way to do that is to actually use your own images. You use your own images, you, you can control the sizing, you can control the rights to it, and plus it gives a great authentic flair that's going to put you in a position to, to succeed. One place that we like at BusyWeb is Big Stock. It's bigstockphoto.com. That's a really great place to get images at a very reasonable price. By and large, if you're going to purchase an image, it really should only be between about $1 to $10. And $10 is on the high side. If you want a celebrity, you can do that, and you can purchase one, but it gets very expensive very, very quickly. So when we're communicating through the content, really, we want to do make sure when we create the email, we have a couple of standards that we follow no matter what. Number one, we want to make sure that every image that we include in our email is clickable. I can't tell you how many times where I've looked at an image uh, either in an email or online, and I thought, yep, I would like to interact with that. I would like to purchase that thing. So I click on the picture, and what do I get taken to? Uh, picture that I just clicked on. Everything in your email should be active and creating positive momentum for you, so make sure that all of your images are clickable. Keep the key action that you want above the scroll line. What, is, what do I mean by the scroll line? That's at the bottom of your screen where everything below that has to be, you have to scroll down to see. It's kind of like the fold in a newspaper. The most important information gets put above the fold. You want to make sure that you're digitally above the fold as well. And last, you want to make sure that you limit the choices that you give. If you give somebody three choices, they are going to make whatever choice they want. The goal here is not to let them choose what they want to do. You want them to choose what you want to do. So limit the amount of choices you can give to people. So we talked about growing a healthy list. We talked about growing healthy, growing create great content. How do we create a beautiful template that really matches our brand? Let's get into that now. First and foremost, when we're talking about this, we want to make sure that we look great in any inbox. We talked about mobile when we got started. And when we're talking about mobile, we have to keep in mind that almost 80% of the people who are seeing our emails are going to be seeing it on a 4-inch screen or smaller. So no matter how awesome it looks on your PC, how great it looks, you have to make sure, sure that it also looks good on a 4-inch screen as well. Here's a great example of what an email looks like on a PC versus on a um, uh, on a mobile device, you can see it fits within the screen. Now the, the, the font sizes aren't too small. It's easily readable. 
on either side. So the way you do that is by making sure that it's optimized for mobile. And we'll get into that and talk about a couple of rules you want to follow to make sure that it optimizes for mobile. Again, one of the reasons why we really like Constant Contact is they have hundreds of templates that are available that you can edit to add your own branding, but a lot of them are already optimized for mobile. And second, it also ensures that you have consistent branding. It's very easy to change a color and add a logo, and doing so makes it really pop and makes it look like you. So I provided an example here, that same email of consistent in branding. You can see on the website and in the email or even on Facebook, we're using the same imagery, the same colors of pink, and we're also using the same language because no matter where you are in the country, there are certain idiosyncrasies of language. And if you think I'm wrong, ask the person next to you what they're calling that can of Coca-Cola. Here in Minnesota, we call it pop. If you go to Michigan, they call it soda. And if you go to Atlanta, they call Pepsi Coca-Cola. Everything is Coca-Cola down there. So you want to make sure that based on what your customer base is, that you are speaking, truly speaking, their language and, even, and making sure that you're picking up on local idioms. Here are a couple of different examples of the different kinds of, of uh, email communications that you can put out. So for instance, we've got a um, we've got a newsletter here. This is for Gorilla Doctors. It helps send uh, news or updates, and it helps educate the people on what you're doing. Here's an announcement from a, a restaurant. It's an invitation to a special event at the restaurant. You can see it's a little simpler. It's a little. Uh, it's got the logo. It's a little fancier, and it's clearly trying to get you to do one specific thing. Promotions are great as well. Again, that's a great way to, to make people feel special by giving them exclusive content and even asking for feedback by offering them something in return. Uh, and that's a, that's, a, that's a great example of that there. So simple recipe for success, success what we tend, tend to follow when we're working with email marketing for our clients generally looks like this. Number one, use a single column template. If you do more than one temp column, then it's when it shrinks to a mobile device, it's going to look very, very small. You want to make sure that you have fewer than three images, which I've talked about a couple of times, fewer than 20 lines of text, no more than three to five links. Generally speaking, you shouldn't have more than one or two, and the key action is above the scroll line. That's simple enough, right, Jenna? Yeah, I think so. Well, let's see if it gets any more complicated. Well, it does. Ha! Funny. How do we get our email opened? We can't just send out emails and expect them all to get opened and haul of our people to do exactly what we want them to do, which is ostensibly to buy from us. So what does that look like? Well, let's get into it now. We want to give people four reasons to pay attention to us. <clears throat> Number one, we want to make sure that they know who we are. If we uh, I, I, in my job here at, as, at BusyWeb as the director of Buzz Development, I can guarantee you that I meet hundreds and hundreds of people a year, and never one of them have I, has ever had the name of info at. So anytime I get an in, email from info at, I don't know who that person is. Next, we want to make sure that we have a compelling subject. So I know who you are. What do you want from me? What are you trying to communicate to me? Your subject line has to be interesting and grab my attention. Next, it has to be good timing. I have to be open and interested to hear that message that you're providing. And we'll talk about how to figure that out in just a second. And lastly, I want to make sure that any email that I send out, uh, I get a butterfly effect by offering great social and easy social options to get my audience to do what I want them to do. I want them to share socially with their friends and family so that I can have many more ripples in the pond as I throw this out. So let's talk about the first one. Who sent? How do people know me, and how how do I uh, how do they know me best? So what you want to do is make your from name and from email recognizable. This is an easy small business fix that a lot of small business owners don't have. If they have a web, if you have a website, you should get free email, and it should be a vanity email from your company. If it's not, if you're still using a Gmail address, I'd strongly encourage you to look into that because you're losing a lot of wind speed by not having your from email be part of your company name. You also want to make sure that you are consistent across all of your social channels, who you are, what you look like, 
what you stand for needs to be the same across every channel that you provide. So when you're in a crowd of people like this and you see a crowd of people that you want a certain amount of people to know who you are immediately because more than one third of those people open an email based exclusively on the subject line alone. Every one of us has people that we don't necessarily like talking to, but they send us email anyway. And if we know that it's urgent, we know if it's pressing, we know if it's, if it's something, an action that we have to take today, we're, more than a third of the people are going to open just based on that. This is an opportunity for you to be a little clever, and but very, very clear and identify your purpose when you are writing a subject line. How, so this is a, a yoga studio, and uh, their subject line is acro yoga at 11,000 feet, are you in? What are they trying to do there? Well, they're trying to get us to come to a class, right? But they're telling us what the class is, what the benefit is, and they're asking, they're challenging us to come to the class and try it out. It's a great subject line. Size matters, though, when it comes to subject lines. You don't want to write a paragraph, and also keep in mind that you want to make, that you want to have your email subject line read the same on a mobile device as it does on a large device. So the easiest way to do this to keep it short. I'll give you an example of one of Jenna's greatest failures in the company here. She recently did an email for a real estate agent and who wanted to have a, uh, a um, what did he want to do? He was trying to do a survey for his past clients to see what, what did they like about him and how could he get return business. And so Jenna's, Jenna's subject line was, I need help, could you, could, would you mind, question mark. Which is a great subject line, which is pretty typical for Jenna to write an amazing subject line. So we sent that over to the client and we asked him if that was okay and he said, sure, go ahead. But before he sent it out, he changed the email subject line to, uh, John Smith needs some loving, would you be available? And what do you think that people on a mobile device read? It was, John Smith needs some loving. So we went from having a perfectly benign professional communication to something that was, let's say, uh, less, than, less than productive for him just by changing that subject line. Keep it short, keep as few words as possible. And, and here are a couple of rules of thumb to keep in mind. Number one, no more than about 40 characters. You can go up to about 60 if, if you're really getting it. Really, the first two to four words are going to be the most important. Don't go over about six to ten words, and then make sure that it's interesting to your clients. The easiest way to do this is to send this your email to somebody and say, would you open this email? Probably want to call them first and say, hey, I'm sending you an email. Let me know if you'd like to open it or not. And the, one of the neatest ways to do this, again, using constant contact, is the pre-header text. That's a little bit of data that comes in before the email that you can customize. And it looks like that. See where it says aspire to higher ground? That's that, uh, that's that, that pre-header text. There are words you're going to want to try and avoid. Uh, these are spammy type words that will, if you use a lot of them, or even uh, multiple exclamation points, uh, you get, you're going to potentially have some spam issues. Really, unless you're starring in a show on Telemundo, you should never use two exclamation points for anything. So words like free, uh, anything in capital letters, anything with a, more than one exclamation point in it will more than likely get you put in spam. So figure out different ways to, to share this when you're doing this. We talked about timing, and this gets a little nerdy as we're talking about how to figure out time, so stay with me. Well, first of all, how often are you going to be sending to, eat to people? Well, you want to keep the promises you made when we asked for the email address to start. Don't send a lot. Generally speaking, most people send out a monthly newsletter. Uh, and if you have an urgent communication, then you can certainly do that a, a, as necessary. But again, the, the goal here is not to overwhelm our audience with lots and lots and lots of stuff. We want to continue to stay top of mind by, by uh, having some communications uh, on a regular basis. What day and time uh, should you communicate? Well, Constant Contact will tell you that the best day of the week to send, their, send an email is between Tuesday and Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. 
but Content Contact has millions and millions of subscribers, so that's not necessary. There's a that's a lot of email going out in a, in a one specific time. There's a wide spectrum of how valuable that time, particular time period is. I would argue that the best way to find out your time for your audience is by doing a lot of testing and figuring out based on metrics which we're going to end up on how how do we get there and we even see it here when i share i've got a couple of different examples here restaurants the best time to send emails is monday morning accountants financial advisors hotels and bed and breakfast those all fit into that tuesday to wednesday model religious organizations like churches that that doesn't work on tuesday or wednesday that's more of a Thursday model. And then arts and crafts, which is sort of a weekend activity, the best time to send that is on Friday. So the best way to do that is to actually test what's, what's best for you over the course of two to three months. Finally, we talked about uh, easy social sharing. This is a great opportunity to pick up a tremendous amount of wind speed by integrating social media into your icons. Social media buttons increase click-through rates in an email by over 150 percent. I'll say that again because it's a big number, over 150 percent. So just by including that simple, simple social bar there, you're offering people the opportunity and begging them really just click here and you'll be able to share this with your friends and make their lives so much better. All right, we're rounding third and getting coming closer to the end. Let me check the time. Yep, we've got plenty of time. But here's the most important thing that we're gonna be talking about today. How do we track our results? How do we measure what success is? And how do we really put a number on that? Well, <clears throat> let's get into it now. Before I do that, Jenna, any questions using the hashtag Missy webinar? Uh, we don't have any, uh, it doesn't look like it now. Super. Awesome. Let's finish this up. So there's an old saying in marketing communities like ours, that if you're not measuring, you're not marketing. What does that mean? It means that there's a difference between advertising and marketing. In marketing, we want to have a clear expectation of what our goal is. The easiest way to do that is by understanding the metrics just a fancy way of saying numbers for what we're doing. There's a lot of metrics that are going to be available to us. We want to know which ones that are particularly relevant. And by understanding what's relevant and what's important, we can then leverage that data to make really good decisions and to improve our marketing effort and focus on the click-through. So what's a click-through? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a marketing metric that is really the, the start of what becomes incredibly crucial for you. So think of a billboard on the highway. If you're driving by a billboard, uh, how many of you have seen a billboard today? What was the billboard? What did it say? Do you remember? Chances are, if you're anything like me, you probably haven't remembered. So is that an effective use of our dollars as a small business owner? What if we were able to present that information in a different way and actually ask people to do something? Chances are good we, we, we'd get a much better result for our money, and that's what a click-through rate is. Okay, when we're talking about email marketing, there's a couple of statistics that really, that really uh, sort of matter. So the first one is the open rate. So let's let's use a hypothetical email list of a thousand people. In that thousand people, the open rate will tell us how many people opened our email. That is the initial definition of what our audience is. So we know those are the people that that in, in our ballpark, and that's who we're playing with. That'll also help us gauge our interest. If we're sending out bad content, if we have the wrong list, if we're talking to the wrong people, or even the wrong day and time. We want to judge that based on what our open rate is. A good open rate is about 20 to 25 percent, uh, depending upon the industry. It really varies anywhere from 10 to 30, but usually here at BusyWeb, we're in the 25 to 35 range for our clients that we work with. Click-throughs is the second one. So we've defined our audience. Everybody in the ballpark is the open rate. The next step is the click-through rate. How many people took the action that we asked them to take by reading that email. That is our first beacon of success. That is our flag of when, whether or not we're successful or not in our marketing campaign. How many people took the action that we wanted them to take? Not how many people saw it, not how many people thought about it later when they were at home, 
sitting in front of Facebook, how many people right then took the action that we wanted them to take? That will do two things. Number one, it will help us define what our success is and, and at, uh, avail us of the opportunity to understand if we hit our successful goal by knowing who took the action. Next, it'll also help us identify people who are engaged with us and are engaged in our company. Those are the people that will start to become your raving fans as you work into it. A good click-through rate is about 10% of your, of your open rate. If you're really, really good, you can get that up to 20%. If you're astonishingly good, you can get that up to 30%. But by and large, a 10 to 15% click-through rate, if you get that, you're doing pretty good. Did not opens tells you just as much as the opens tell us. That tells us how many, uh, by and large, are we hitting industry averages for what we do, but also why didn't they open it? Did they send us to spam? Do we have a bad email address? Did we get an autoresponder back, like somebody who's on vacation or out of the office? By learning from that negative and learning why we didn't get the successful metric, we can actually create better success in future months. We do that by re-engaging those people in a new way. It helps us understand is it the content, is it a physical barrier that we can overcome, and we can learn on, on how to test new methods to try and re-engage those people. By and large, again, if we're talking about a 20 to 25 percent open rate, then our not open rate, again, is going to be about 75 to, to, to 90 percent. But don't necessarily worry about that. The, you want to look at a, a didn't open rate over time and make sure that it by and large jives with your open rates. Opt-outs are the people who are just not interested in, work, in, in receiving your email anymore. It could be for a number of different reasons. It could be because they're bored. It could be because it's not interesting. It could be because you smell funny. Any number of things, really. What it does allow you to do is, in using a, an email service provider like Constant Contact, you do have a number of different options that you can define why people are wanting to get out. You've communicated with them too much. The information isn't interesting. By doing that, you get to create, collect a lot of feedback to learn what you can be doing better and adjust your strategy accordingly. Statistically, less than 1% of the people should be opting out from your emails. Bounces we talked about a little. Those are the people who uh, gave you an email address and, and it's just not a good address. Maybe they moved on. Maybe they gave you a fake address. Maybe you transposed a number, something like that. Learning what, about your bounce rate will actually help you maintain a clean list. And depending upon how many emails you send out, you know, the industry average is about you know five to ten percent bounce rate, and that's pretty standard. Helps you keep a clean list, and again, uh, clean up the size of that audience, that first initial audience uh, pen that you're creating, that ballpark figure of who's looking at what. So <clears throat> when we're talking about all these, th 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 these numbers that we get, what, what do we do with them? Well, what happens is the metrics help us make, decision, make good decisions moving forward. So if we have low numbers, what is does that mean we're not doing a good job? No, it just means that we have to make decisions on how to increase our, our, our numbers. So if we have low opens, well, do we have a recognizable first name? What does our subject line do? Is it interesting enough? And is, is the time correct? If we have low clicks, well, that's telling us that our call to action isn't as strong as we want it to be, or it's too long, or we're sending it to the wrong people. So these are decisions we get to learn from by actually doing a quick analysis of the numbers. Similarly, if we have high metrics, like if we have high open rates, it's because we found a really great time and day that our audience is interested in, in, in interacting with us. We've identified interesting keywords. We've found people who are raving fans who are always going to deal with us and always going to work with us. And then the, the, the $64,000 result is that high click-through rate. We've formatted link, links to stand out. We've gotten really great content, and we've even found some super clickers who, who are always going to click on everything we want. And we want to take those super clickers and turn that from a marketing exercise into a sales exercise and have those super clickers get called on to make sure that we're working with them. So 
we've talked about a lot of these numbers, but what, where do we really get into the most interesting ones? That's really starts on the click-through rate, which is right there. That's really where the start of the engagement process really starts when you get in somebody to offer you one specific yes. Once that happens, then that that then you can start getting people to go to your website, looking at your content, making a decision about whether or not they want to take the next engagement process. You can also view the clickers and view who clicked on this, and this is something that's pretty exclusive to Constant Contact. However, it's important that I share with you this one simple fact. There's a fine line between understanding who your, your clickers are and stalking. You don't want to pick up the phone and say, Jenna, I, how come you clicked on my email at 2.30 p.m.? Tell me about that. What, what made you want to click on that? What is that if somebody does, does that, Jenna? What is what, sorry? It's, I was checking Twitter. <laughs> it's creepy. It's it creepy. Is creepy. Right. Yes. We don't want to be creepy. A better comment to make is, Jenna, how did you, did, what did you find interesting about my email if you got a chance to read it? So it also helps us understand who is, uh, we can start targeting and segmenting our list based on the people who are interested all the time. Those people who are clicking on us all the time, those are people that we want to make sure that we treat very specially because those are the best chance we have of converting those prospects into real deal customers. All right, we're, we're, we're nearing the end, and I've got some interesting information to give, but we're, 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 let's talk about next steps before we get started. So what does an ideal email look like? We'll go through this real quick. The subject line is short. It's only six to, six to 10 words. It's got our business name in the, uh, in, in the from name. There's a pre-header text so somebody can at a glance know what we're trying to accomplish. The logo is clickable. We're communicating through images, not through a lot of words, and the important information is above the fold and above the the click the, uh, the the scroll line. We don't have a lot of text. We've got less than 20 lines. There's a clear to, uh, call to action, and there's not any more clicks below that. It's got our brand colors in it, and we've even got social media buttons. So we're asking people to share and follow us and interact with us on social media. At the end of the day, and I've said this before, I want to I, I want to reiterate it before we go for the day, is small business marketing is measuring your marketing, but it's also very, very simple at its at its base. It's nurturing relationships, it's delivering on a promise, and getting measurable results. If you can do those three things, you're going to be successful. And even more important than that, you have a tremendous advantage over big national brands. You have a great connection to your customers. You are unique, you are interesting, you have interesting things to say, and you, you have interesting things that you can market your business and yourself with. So here's three simple steps to get started. Number one, get your contact list together. I guarantee you, it will be longer and more robust than you think it is. Next, create an email, hit send. Even if you're not sure what to do, pick a basic template, put some information together and send it out. It'll help you get the ball rolling. It'll help you start to understand the metrics process and start refining your message. Third, watch what happens. See what kind of results you get. See how interesting it is. See what if you've gotten any sales from it. And if not, how do we get there? Marketing is a journey. You're never going to hit it right on the first step. But the quicker you get there, the smarter you get there. Is, is it creates more success for you. And the way you do that is by understanding what you did well, what you didn't do so well, and what you're going to do better next time. You really can do this. This is, I've thrown in a lot of information here, but I wanted to end with this idea that, that this is not as challenging as you might think. This is, this is a new skill to learn. This is a new process to learn, but it's very easy. The easiest way to do this is by having a nice backbone that takes a lot of the heavy lifting off of you. That's one of the reasons why we at BusyWeb really like Constant Contact, and we like it so much so that we ask Constant Contact to give you a special deal for staying with us today. If you go to that URL, constantcontact.com slash event dash Meyer, for staying part of this and hopefully laughing politely at some of my jokes. You can get three months of email mar marketing for five bucks a month. 
this doesn't matter the size of your list. It doesn't matter how many emails you send out. It'll cost you five bucks a month to really get started and really see if this is a viable tool for you. It's a great deal. It's only going to be available today. It's only going to be available if you've sat through this entire webinar and only if you go to that constantcontact.com slash dash event slash event dash Meyer. Before we go, a couple of quick plugs. We talked about text to join. So here's our text to join list. If you're not part of our email list, I encourage you to do so. Text busy to 22828 and you'll take you'll see that constant contact tool. We use it here at BusyWeb every single day to help grow our email list. If you're interested in other trainings, we do this on a regular basis. We also do special events here in the Twin Cities. You can go to busyweb.com slash events and see what what's on the schedule for the next couple of weeks. If you would like to get started on Constant Contact, but you don't necessarily want to spend the money, you, Constant Contact does offer a free 60-day trial, meaning no credit card, no obligation. Here's the software. Give it a shot. Let us know what you think. Their bet is that you're going to like it, and it's going to be easy to use, and it's going to make you some money, which is why they offer you that. Finally, though, Constant Contact does have a tremendous amount of marketing resources that I think is great. They have a great knowledge base. They have a lot of webinars, a lot of interesting things. And you can go to blogs.constantcontact.com slash library to check that, out. check that out. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, if you're interested in getting the, the, the uh, PowerPoint, you can email me there. But uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow as we're participating in Constant Contact's Day of Digital. But if you're uh, a regular busy webinar uh, viewer, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. And Jenna, do you want to uh, do the honors? Bye.